From theaters to concert sites to parks, almost every community in Ohio has venues that bring people together at big events like festivals. On the east side of Columbus, people have gathered for decades at the annual Hot Times Festival in Old Town East. It's an event where you'll find local vendors, art installations, and music performances, and you're almost guaranteed to see some old friends, too. We got to talk with longtime participants Tony and Aziza West to find out more about the history of Hot Times. Hot Times Festival is interesting. We were there from the beginning. Started on 18th Street. The people who lived in the community would have a table and they'd bring out and bring some stuff that they could show and then talk about it, maybe sell too, as well. It was a chance to buy those things that people were bringing out of their houses that were like heirlooms and stuff. We were the ones that began to show West African drum and dance because that was during the era and the age of the drums and things coming about. This was a chance for us to learn more and share more about the African-centered culture, which we were learning. And then, of course, at that time, you had all the other cultures here. They were showing, too. So it was kind of like, let's everybody come together. So it was fun. Mm -hmm. Then the music, of course, was interesting. And not till I guess it moved that you got, you know, really start doing with the big bands and stuff. Jazz and all of that stuff, well, it really, really started going on. And that was just the beginning and the blooming of everything. Now, it used to be just one tent, you know. Now they have three stages or four stages, you know. Uh, Cause at one point, one of the stages is the one over there in the walkway. We started that because something was happening. We just got on that platform and started doing things. And then they came up, oh, there, there's a place for a stage. People come all over because they want some relief, some release. It's a way to get away from the news and all of that stuff that's happening outside right now. When you come here for that Friday, that Saturday, and that Sunday, that Saturday morning with the parade with the children. I and mean, when you come here, you get away from it for a while. It's like a reunion. It's like a meeting place. It's older people, younger people, new people, generations of people. And they look forward to it because the congeniality is just there. It's just there. The spirit here is not like it is somewhere else. Yeah, the general groups pretty much can find their own group here. Their music is on at different times of the day. We got Africans uh, coming from, from Senegal, Mali, Sierra Leone, Guinea, uh, all in places uh, here, uh, Ghana, you know, and not only uh, selling stuff, but talking. Like one of the persons used to be Kojo and his photography. You have people who make jewelry. You have people that send incense. If you name it in the culture, they're here doing that. For me, it's important that I can see my African-centered community out here, people enjoying themselves that way, and I can see other communities enjoying themselves like that. And then, we're, we're, it's not even, we don't even have to talk politics, it's here. And, and, and then when we go outside of, of this here, it, it, it's almost like you're outside of the Magic Kingdom. I mean, it's, yeah, think of those things. It's that's, really, yeah, yeah, it's that's, really that's different. As the, Hot Times community sees itself and sees itself growing, it, it always has to take, turn around and look at the volunteers. And when Hot Times calls on their volunteers, the first thing they ask is, what am I getting out of it? Well, most of the time, it's a sense of community for what your community is doing and how does that add to the community at large. They have some of the best volunteers because they're giving to their, their community. They're giving because they want to do. They're doing what they can do and give. We're here because, you know, we're sharing our talents. We're sharing it. Yeah, we're culture. sharing right. and our culture. We're sharing it. You see a couple of guys go by and picking up the trash. And you feel good about that because it shows respect and concern and care. It may seem 
small to someone. But you know what? It's important and it's good to that person that can do it. And you get so much out of even just that. Even for the volunteer person that gives out the programs and the pamphlets or the t-shirts, it's relationship, it's community, it's feeling safe, it's feeling clean, it's feeling good. It's just like homecoming. When you hear hot times, I'm telling you the truth, people will come. Yeah. They will pass it on down through their family line. I'm talking about you go from the great grandparent, one, the grandparent, to the, you know, to the mother, to the children. Come, you gotta go to hot, this is where we used to be. This is what we used to do. Yeah, different groups do now. meet here. They look forward to it. it. It makes you happy to know that you can count on it. And knowing that you can count on it this year, and then next year, and again in the future, that's gonna be healthy. I think it's going to be healthy for the community. We think we know a lot about Ohio history, but sometimes notable people and places get lost in time. For instance, historians had never seen a photo of the Emil Ambos Pleasure Farm until someone discovered a collection of glass negatives in a barn in Grove City. We check in with the folks at the Columbus Metropolitan Library as they uncover that history for us. Emil Ambos' father is Peter Ambos. He's actually originally from Germany, but he moved to America uh, starting in Norfolk, Virginia, where he had a confectionery. He ended up moving to Columbus and set up another confectionery. Peter Ambos was successful in his business and then had another success when he managed to land Dorothea Yeager as his wife. Dorothea was one of the daughters of Christian Frederick Yeager, one of the pioneers of the German community in Columbus. Emil was born in 1844 in Columbus and eventually Emil went into the liquor business. With all this money that's coming in from the liquor business, he decides to buy this property out by Alum Creek and it's by these little lakes, what would be modern day Livingston Avenue and College Avenue, uh, right near where Berwick is today. This property, we always hear stories about in Columbus, but we've never had really great photographs. I had seen maybe one drawing of it at one time. And when we found this collection, it was a huge find for Columbus history and particularly people of the east side and Berwick. This is a property that is a pleasure ground. People go out there on beautiful, warm, sunny days. They sit by the water, they have a lovely picnic, they get in their rowboats, and they go out on the lake. He stocked these two lakes very well with all sorts of fish. He builds a dam with a bridge across the top. You can see below it kind of falls down into a waterfall. And he also builds mesh screens along the edge of the lake where it drops down into Alum Creek. So he had this really well-stocked lake and he wanted to keep them there for his own purposes. He builds walking bridges. He builds a water fountain. He has a water tower. He has the windmill. Um, he has stables for his horses and he builds um, many different cabins and from my understanding a residence as well. We have an image that shows a few individuals sitting on this mounded island in the lake and when you zoom in on that one we realized that behind this man's head you can see some antlers. We did a little bit more research and came to find that Emil Ambos used to allow the Elks to host their annual clam bake at his estate you can also importantly see his small-scale paddle boat and that image was crucial to our research because that's the one that actually has his nickname written across the top and that allowed Aaron to positively identify this property, these photographs. At the very top here it says Uncle A.M.E. I didn't know what that meant and I started doing some research and I ended up finding a reference to this boat on the Columbus Dispatch database that we have. And that was Emil Ambos's nickname, Uncle M. And then when we started doing more research, we realized that the people in the photographs were Edmund Aris and his wife, Elizabeth, and they are uh, relations to the Jaegers who married into the Ambos family. So Edmund Aris is Emil Ambos's second cousin. So that's how we kind of pieced everything together and we realized who the people were in the photographs. This would be the Aris 
and Jaeger family. Edmund is actually very young in this picture, so we're, we're able to date it in the late um, 1880s. We think he's about 12 in that photo. And we believe one of these men is Emil at a younger age. Emil did live quite an opulent lifestyle. He was known for his wide array of fashions. He was said to wear a different attire each day of the week to ride his horse and ride, in fact, a different horse each day of the week. He was actually really well known as sort of a philanthropist, particularly to orphans. He's always mentioned in the dispatches, giving food and clothing to kids, particularly um, African-American children. He's always throwing parties for them, especially during Christmas. He also has many servants or bodyguards. One in particular was Albert Carr. And from a young age, he was with Ambos and was one of his servants. Emil passes away in 1898. Emil's about 53 years old and he passes away. So really young. Not surprising, he dies of liver disease, a dealer in spirits. His will's very long and detailed, 17 pages long on legal sheets. It did take a long time for them to figure out too because it was so long and so detailed and all these people are wanting money. He spells it out, who's gonna get his horses, who's gonna get his money. Emil Ambos leaves $500 to everyone who has worked for him. He does not itemize a list of these people. He also leaves $1,000 to Albert Carr because he's such a valued friend, but he does not articulate that Albert Carr works for him and should therefore also be privy to that additional $500. So Albert Carr is granted $1,000 as stated in the will. He sues for the $500. And then in the end, they settle for $250. But it's actually Edmund Aris's father, John D. Aris, who represents Albert Carr to help him secure that financial settlement. He's very close with the family in so much that Edmund Aris and, and his wife Elizabeth sort of take him in as a child. And there's even a picture of him on the heiress's mantle right above their fireplace. Most important for the city of Columbus is that he bequeaths part of his property out in Berwick to the city. So out of that 116 acres, he's decided to leave 30 odd acres to the city in perpetuity to be operated as a park known as Ambos Park. And it's something that everyone, it seems, for the most part, quite enthusiastic about. But things get a little complicated, as they often do. The city councilmen take trips out to the property. <laughs> One day they love it, they think it's beautiful, there's plenty of shade, it's gonna be this fabulous addition to the city. And then the next day they change their mind and decide, no, no, it's too far out. More likely, the real reasoning behind it is that Emil Ambos stated in his will the exact individuals he wanted involved in operating the park for their lifetime. They're not even sure if that's even legal to have people looking over the park for a lifetime. Lawyers were, were arguing about whether that can even be possibly done. So what they decide to figure out if they're gonna accept the, the property or not is they, they have a seance. There's a, a city councilman who's a spiritualist and he brings in a medium and they want to rise Emil Ambos from the dead <laughs> um, and have them speak to them about what he wants to be done with the property. And ultimately they Say they contact Emil Ambos from the grave, and he says to them, you know, I've changed my mind. I was gonna give it to you, but now I think you're all short skates and I don't wanna give it to you anyway. With that, according to the papers, they rule not to take the property. Seven against it and five for it. It's quite interesting that the council member who initiated the seance was one of those in favor of the park and he really wanted to contact Emil Ambos to seal the deal when unfortunately it backfired on him. Ultimately, it becomes Shady Lane Nursery, and they're a large nursery on the east side, dealing mostly through the early 1910s, 1920s. They ultimately decide to um, sell it to make a golf course. After the golf course, the property was redeveloped as a housing development. Now, there are some lovely houses there, but back up Lakeside. Another major stipulation of the will is that he has a life-size sculpture of him uh, put at his grave in Greenlawn. So he's now in Greenlawn with his fisherman hat on, his pole, and those fish. And they said at any time during the day, you could say at two o'clock in the morning, hey, Emil, do you want to go fishing? He would get up, take his fishing rod, and he would go out and fish. It's one of the most anticipated events of the summer. It attracts people of all persuasions, whether they come for the entertainment, to see the animals, or to sample the latest fried foods. It is the state fair. And while there's nothing like actually visiting the fair in person, 
exploring the history of the fair at the Ohio History Connection might be a close second. Hi, Lisa. Oh, hello, Brent. How are I, you today? I'm well. I'm, I'm reminded of the saying, all's fair, because we're talking about the fair today, right? Yes, yes, the Ohio State Fair. It is one of the oldest and largest fairs in the country. Has it always been in Columbus? No, no. In fact, the first year when the fair started in 1850, it was held in Cincinnati. Ah. This is a print illustrating that first fair in Cincinnati. The reason that Cincinnati was chosen in 1850 for the fair is because it was the state's largest city and it was very accessible by rail because it was actually by train that the exhibitors would ship livestock and other things to the fair and also that people would travel to the fair. But the thing about the fair is because it was hard to travel from one part of the state uh -huh. to another, even though it was a state fair, a lot of the people that attended and exhibited at that first fair in Cincinnati were from southwestern Ohio. So because they wanted to offer other parts of the state that opportunity to host the fair because it was a huge economic opportunity. They moved the fair around and from year to year the oh, fair would travel to a new city and every city that wanted the fair would you know campaign to get the fair and you had so much money that you had to have available to support the fair. So it, it would travel from 1850 up until 1874. It was moving from place to place until it came here permanently. And, and once it got here, it didn't stay planted in one place, right? No, no. The first time that Columbus hosted the fair in 1851, it was in the Franklinton area. And then again in I think it was 1855, we also put it in the Franklinton area. And then when we hosted the fair in 1864 and 1865 during the Civil War, it was in Schiller Park. Hmm. So we have moved it around quite a bit. Also Franklin Park. Franklin Park hosted the fair for a number of years, 1874 to 1885, it was in Franklin Park. It finally came to its current location in 1886, and there's been some talk of moving it, but it has not moved. I, I doubt it's likely to move at this point. It's pretty established. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking here at Newark. Is this when the fair was in yes. Newark one year? Yes. This was in 1854. Part of the fairgrounds encompassed the Hopewell Earthworks ah. in Newark. Yes, it's very interesting. But again, people were traveling there primarily by train. The railroads were big supporters because they would give people who were shipping livestock and other equipment to the fair, they could ship for free. Wow. They also reduced rates for people who were traveling wow. to the fair. It was a little controversial having the fair in smaller places like Newark. Newark was a smaller city then, and they didn't have as much capacity as Cincinnati or Columbus or Cleveland to bring in all the visitors. There were not not enough boarding houses and places for people to stay and right. so forth. So fairs in the smaller cities were not often as yeah. well attended because there just wasn't as much capacity for, for visitors. Uh -huh. The Stereo Opticon pictures. These are Zanesville, is that correct? These are Zanesville, yes. These are amazing because in the 1850s, outdoor photography could be very challenging. You had to have bright light, you needed everybody and everything in the picture to stand still. So in the 1850s, a lot of photography is still just portraits. But here we have some early examples of someone doing more documentary style mm -hmm. photography mm -hmm. at an event. The weather was not great that year. Um, you know how we always wonder what will the weather be like for the fair? Yeah. Will it be too hot? Uh -huh. Will it rain? Well, the fairs tended to be in the 1850s. They usually scheduled them later in the fall, in September and October. And it had this tendency to rain <laughs> during the fair. And this one was no exception. It, it was a bit rainy. 
This one is from Dayton, and this is interesting because on one hand it's advertising the fair, but it's also advertising one of the great new devices that will be displayed at the fair in 1867, the Young's Gasoline Cook uh -huh, Stove. So people trying to sell you stuff. That's not changed much over the years, has no, it? No, <laughs> no, but this was also at, in 1850s and 1860s, this was really a huge opportunity for people to learn about these things. They weren't watching commercials on television or seeing ads on Facebook or listening to the radio. The fair really was a great opportunity to tell people about things like steam engines and gasoline cook stoves. I wonder if they were frying strange things back then. You know, fried hardtack, that'd be your <laughs> dessert at the, uh, at the fair that fair, year. Well, food was definitely part of it. Entertainment was definitely a part of it. In the early years, promotion of agriculture and advancement of agriculture was, was the primary thing, but certainly entertainment and food were a factor. Well, music's always a big thing at the fair. There's been choirs and bands at the fair, right? It looks like that's gone back quite a few years. Yes, apparently in Ohio, I mean, if you've been to the Ohio State Fair, you've seen the All Ohio Fair Band. The All Ohio State Fair Boys Band started in 1925. You, you'll note I said boys. Right. For many years, it was only boys who were accepted to participate in the band. You'll see in this picture, it still says All Ohio State Fair Boys Band. This picture was taken in 1974, and then here, this one in 1975, oh, they've taken, they have they've a taken new a banner. Word off the banner there, haven't they? They've <laughs> taken a word off the banner, and it now just says All Ohio State Fair Band. Because in 1975, for the first year, the band was co-ed. I think it's cute because they're wearing the same uniforms and really what gives it away is the banner you don't necessarily notice right away right. that the band has gone co-ed but yes they went for 50 years as an all-boys organization another thing that they used to do is for a long time from 1925 until 1950 the boys at the fair lived in tents while they were there so you can see here mm -hmm. they are outside some uh -huh. of their tents uh -huh. in 1935 so they went from tents to living in an Ohio National Guard building, and now they stay at the Road Center. Well, this is fascinating. What else do you have to show us that's associated with the fair? Well, something that really illustrates in a very visual way how the fair has changed over time is posters. So oh. I pulled a selection of fair posters for you for the cover of the 1890s up till the late 1980s. Great. Now this poster is amazing, just the quality of the artwork and the, uh, and the print. It's, it, you know, it looks like a, somebody painted the whole thing. It is, it is really beautiful. Uh, this year, 1895, marked a huge leap forward in technology for the fair. It was a big landmark year because this was the first year that they had electricity wow. at the fair. You see there's a uh -huh. shining light there in the center and also down here in this portion, in this corner, it says electric light. The big thing about the fair is once it was electrified, it could extend oh, sure. later into the evening, yeah. and horse races were one of the biggest draws uh -huh. at the fair, and this allowed them to have, with electric lights, to have horse races at night. So this was a really, really exciting year for the fair. The next year that we have is 1918. This is at the wow. height of the United States' involvement in World War mm -hmm. One. but the fair went on, and you will notice at the bottom it says, Help Uncle Sam Buy War Saving uh -huh. Stamps. So while they were still having the fair, everyone was still thinking about what was happening in World War sure. One. Yeah. This is from 1956, uh -huh. and I mean, the fair was always, you know, it was always something for the whole family. This is C, the farm animal, baby land at the Ohio State Fair. So I assume it was calves and little chicks and things like that. And the special guests were Roy Rogers, uh -huh. who was uh, an Ohioan, mm -hmm. and Dale Evans with Trigger with too. Trigger. Don't yeah. worry, yeah. Trigger was the horse. They had Trigger with him. So here are some posters from the 70s and the roster of entertainment is starting to take top billing, as you can see. Bob Hope, who is another Ohioan, came to the fair a lot. <laughs> he did a lot of performances at the fair over the years. 
And last but not least, we have one from the 1980s. This is interesting because in 1981, they made a decision to extend the fair. And from 1981 to 2003, the fair was 17 days long. And so this was, as you can see, 18 sensational days. Wow. This is one of the years when we had an extended fair. These are terrific items and it just reminds us how much we love the fair and how much great stuff is associated with the fair. Thanks for sharing it with us. Well, thank you for stopping by, Brent. Thanks for being with us, and remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.